<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Hey, um, I'll wait until some people roll in here so they don't miss out. We're going to have breakfast next Sunday. That last guy coming in. We're going to have breakfast next Sunday morning, 9 o'clock till 9.30. And we'll, we'll be cutting it off at 9.30 so we get everything cleaned up before the service. But we will be having breakfast next Sunday. We'll have breakfast. How many times did I say that? How many? We're going to have breakfast, right? There's still people coming in. We're going to have breakfast next Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, it's in the bulletin right here. And... Uh, Everything, we'll have everything prepped and ready to go for you. Um, I also want to remind you of the ladies' Bible study. Uh, that's Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. in the coffee shop. Um, and let's see what else. Fundamentals of Faith. Heath is going to be teaching that uh, beginning Monday, 6 p.m. tomorrow, 6 p.m. We'll be going through the Fundamentals of Faith. And that can be a real fun, exciting study if everyone's getting involved in it. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Oh, your husband was gone, so we didn't get a bulletin. <laughs> um, and as far as our guest speaker rotating uh, tonight, Ellen's going to be sharing with us. Um, of course, you can have, that's in a bulletin as well. We have a uh, rotation schedule set up. Oh, I need to get you the new one, don't I? Because I never sent it to you. Okay. All right. Amen? God is good. All the time. God is good. All the time. Well, we're going to learn that this morning. He is really, really good. He's a good, good father. He loves us. He loves his children. And uh, he wants what's best for us. Uh, you know, we have that image that, that this angry judge, this cosmic cop, that's one that's ready to whack us over the head and throw us into eternal fire. Well, if you don't embrace the free gift that he's given to you, well, yes, that's where you're going to end up. Hell is real. But he's done everything possible to rescue you, to redeem you from hell. And so that's one of the areas that we're going to be looking at as we get deeper this morning. If you're not there yet, turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Um, in chapter 20, we've seen that millennial reign, and at the end of the millennial reign, everyone's standing up before God, the judgment seat, and uh, the, we're told that the, well, everyone, all the dead, and what is the dead? We're going to get deeper into that this morning, too. We're going to get really, really, really deep this morning. The dead, those are those who do not have the spirit of life in them. They stand before God. And if their names are not found written in the book of life, these other books are open. What's written in these books? Every act, every thought, everything that you've ever done in life will be found written in that book. And, uh, and if there, every single sin is not accounted for, well, then it's eternal judgment. But you see, Jesus has accounted for all of our sin. You see, we will not stand before that judgment seat to be condemned because Jesus took our judgment to the cross. He's, he's already been judged, and we're in Him. Remember that? We're in Him. We were in the first Adam, or yeah, the first Adam, but now, as Paul describes him, the last Adam, we're in Him. And so when we, when we stand before God, we'll be standing before in Christ. The judgment has already passed. So we've seen the 1,000-year reign of Christ and then the final judgment for those that uh, have not received Jesus. Now we're picking up in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I put a lot of emphasis upon new. It's a brand new heaven and earth. I take the Bible very literally. It's not refurbished because there's a lot of denominations that teach that we're, that we're simply going to be coming back to a refurbished earth. Uh, but when God created the heavens and the earth, that word created means 
but it's the word that's used there, the Hebrew word, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the word that's used there is bara. It means to be created out of nothing. And we're, we're coming into a new heaven and a new earth. That word is bara. Listen to what Peter wrote, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The elements. That's speaking of all elements. It's all going to burn. Precious people, this world is going to burn. <clears throat> Everything in it will burn. I was just had a fire out here last night. And now everything I put in that fire, burned. <laughs> There's nothing left. And that's what's happening here. But see, we have a tendency to be holding on to and clinging to this, the things of this world. We put our hope in those things. We, we put our trust in stuff. But it's all going to burn. You see, we're placed here to make one decision and one decision only. Do we want a relationship with life? For God is life, light, and love. Do you want a relationship with life? That's the question. That's the only reason we're here. Paul tells us in Acts chapter 17, verses 18. I've quoted that so many times. For some reason, I can't remember the verses. But he says that, that everything is ordained by God. Everything. And it's all designed to push us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, if this is temporal, then why are we hanging on to it? It's all going to burn. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar. There's going to be a, an enormous explosion. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Listen, since all these things are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and in hastening. Are you hastening the day of the Lord? Are you looking forward to that? If you're not, you really need to question your relationship with Jesus. If you're not looking and waiting on the alert, as Jesus said, for His coming then you really need to think about your relationship. Looking for and hastening the day of, the, of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Paul goes on, I'm sorry, John goes on to write. So this is a new heaven and a new earth. Everything's going to be destroyed. Jesus says, behold, I've come to make all things new. That includes the planet. He says, and I saw the holy city. Now, here's the holy city, the capital of the new world that God is going to be creating. The new city. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. The tabernacle, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the tabernacle was among them. This was the meeting place of God. God met with His people while they were traveling through the desert. But here we're told, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. It's all passed away. Now, there's a lot of commentators that say that when we get to heaven, we will have no remembrance of our life upon earth. It's like, why would we not? Because we're, we're going to know, the Bible tells us, we're going to know all things as God knows them. And so we will remember. We're going to remember the people we love and cherish today that will go to hell. We'll, we'll know that. I believe that. I don't think that God's going to wipe that out of our memories. We're going to remember the pain and the suffering that we went through on planet Earth. And what that is going to do is draw us closer to God as we consider where He brought us out of. 
Now, those, th- those people that we love, that we cherish, that will not be in heaven in, uh, with us, it's hard to wrap your mind around. It's hard to comprehend. comprehend. But God's going to wipe away those tears, and we're going to have a full understanding. I can't explain it, but we're not. God loves every single person, just as we love our moms, our dads, our brothers and sisters. He loves every single person. When we get to heaven, though, we're going to have a full understanding. And I don't think there's going to be any mourning of loss. Because we're going to know that every single person had a choice. I, I didn't mean to put a lot of weight on that, but I thought it was important. Because I think we're going to have a full understanding. The Bible does not say we're not going to remember. This says the very opposite. We're going to know all things as he knows them. And I think that's where the peace and the comfort's going to come from. And he who sits on the throne, verse 5, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Remember who John is writing to. This is, actually, this is a prophecy foretelling of the future. But Paul, I'm sorry, John was writing to people in his day. That we're going through all kinds of trials, all kinds of suffering, persecution. That we're watching their loved ones being dipped in tar and burned alive. There was great agony in that day. And so for them, as John's gone through these, this revelation and he's foretelling of this new heaven and new earth, I could imagine it would be difficult to believe. But he says, right, these words are faithful and true. It's going to happen. It will happen. He says, then verse, yeah, verse 6, it says, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm in the beginning and I'm in the end. The story was all about me. Every word written in this book is about Jesus. It's real difficult to understand the Old Testament unless you put Jesus in it. And he says, I am the beginning and I am the end. This is all about me. These words I'm writing to you are faithful and true. Mm, I love this next verse. I just love it. Love it, love it, love it. He says, and I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. It costs you nothing. You don't work for your salvation. You don't have to earn your salvation. It's given freely to you. It's without cost. Jesus said in uh, John chapter 7, verse 37. He says, halfway through the verse, he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? You got to go to Jesus. This is this is a this feast. It was a, if you go back up to verse thirty-seven, he says, "Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood in the crowd and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink.'" This was during the Feast of Tabernacles. This was the very last day of the great feast. During the Feast of Tabernacles, of course, we talked about this last week. It was the most glorious. It was the most grand. It was the most joyful feast of them all. I mean, it was a big old camping trip. You remember this? You know, people would camp out in Jerusalem, and they'd uh, build these little lean-tos, and then all the families would gather together at night. They'd be gazing up in the stars, remembering God's promise to them that they're their ancestors, descendants would be greater than or to outnumber the stars of heaven. This is the promise that he made to Abraham. So here they are, they're camping out. They're telling their children about how God had brought their ancestors out of the land of Egypt, how he brought them through the Red Sea, and then how he provided water from a rock and manna from heaven to feed them. It was, it was an awesome time. And this is what we're going to be doing in heaven. This is one feast, I'm sorry, during the the uh, millennial reign. That's the one feast we'll be celebrating. But what would happen as they camped out, as they had these great feasts, they'd be filling themselves up with good food, 
And then, but on the last day of the feast, well, let me back up. During this great feast, every day there would be a procession of a priest who would go to this pool called Salome. And they'd draw water out and fill these big containers with the water. The word Salome literally means sent one. And they take these, what's that? Sent one. And they take these containers and they'd go to the temple and they'd pour water out on the floor, reminding them how God had provided that water from, water, uh, from the rock. But also telling them, now we're in the promised land. There's no need for the water from the rock. So they'd pour this water out on the temple floor. They would do this each and every day during this great feast. But on the last day of the feast, this procession would go out, but they would return without water in their containers. See, this was also speaking prophetically of what God would do for them. It spoke, you know, what he had done in the past, where they were in the present, but it also spoke of what he had promised, the sent one. So on the last day, they'd come to the temple with these containers and they'd tip them over, over and the people would be standing there with their dry mouths, you know, maybe smacking their lips. And they'd tip it over, but no water would come out. And as there's dead silence, among a crowd, and probably tens of thousands of people. From the back of the crowd, a voice could be heard. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. For from his innermost being will flow rivers of life. See, that's what we're wanting. That is what we're craving. He is the one who satisfies us. And he's going to be satisfying us eternally. There's going to be this river that will flow without cost. Turn with me to Luke, if you would. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Verse 9. If you have a want, if you have a desire, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask. You have a wanting, you have a desire, you have a need. Jesus said, just ask. Ask. And it will be given to you. It will be given to you. All you have to do is ask. That's what Jesus said, right? Just ask. Seek. Now, this, this, this word seek, it's an active indicative. That means it's, he says, keep on seeking. You ask, it's not giving. Jesus said, well, keep on asking, keep on seeking. And, it will, and you will find. You will find. If you seek, you will find. Knock. Keep on knocking. And it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. How many of you believe that? You will receive. You have a want. You have a desire. You have a need. You will receive it. That's the word of Jesus, and I believe it. For everyone who seeks or asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Your son asks for a fish. You're a good father, you're not going to give your son a snake 
If that is if you're in your right mind. I see that, that kind of thing happening today. But Jesus would not do that. <clears throat> a good father would not do that. Now suppose if one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he's not going to receive it or give him a scorpion. If, he, if then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father wants to bless your socks off? He wants to give you what you need, what you're wanting, what you're craving, what you're desiring. He wants to bless you. How much more your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You see, we think it's a bigger house. We think it's a nicer car. We think it's a relationship with another person. We think that's what we're wanting. That's what we're craving. That's what we're desiring. We think it's drugs. We think it's alcohol. We're trying to fill this void. And your Father wants to bless you. He wants to fill your need. But it's by way of His Holy Spirit. You see, what we're craving is that river of life. What we're craving, what we're wanting, what we're desiring is God. He's the only one that can satisfy. He wants to give to you. He wants to bless you. I got that marked in the wrong place. Anyway, let's press on. Um, we're getting deeper here still. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But you're going to inherit God. He's going to be our God. We will be his son. We're going to be his child. If you overcome. Master, how can we do the works of God? What did he say? Believe in the one the Father has sent. Believe. The cowardly. That's referring to those who don't believe. That's what it says. The cowardly and the unbelieving. This is the same person. The cowardly are too concerned what others think of them, what the pressures of the world are, and so they give in, they break up. But the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murder wait, listen, listen, and murderers and immoral persons. That's not us, is it? Maybe this is. And sorcerers and idolaters. I bet you every one of you has got an idol somewhere in your life. Some of us have got one sitting in our living room. That's what we gaze upon 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. Yeah, what is ever, yeah that, that idol. So this is us. But this is saying we can't go to heaven. You remember what Jesus said? If you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. I guarantee you, every one of you men out here still occasionally glance. He said, if you even get angry with someone, you committed murder. So how can we be going to heaven? The key is in the word unbelieving. Unbelieving. If you believe, you see. Turn with me to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. 
You see, the sin is in this flesh. There's two people dwelling in each and every one of you. The old man and the new man. The old man is going to be eternally separated from God. Because the Bible says we're going to receive a new body. You may remember Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were walking with God. They were talking with God. They were communing with God. If they had any need, if they had any question, all they had to do was turn to God. God, I need this. God, what about that? But they made a choice by partaking of that tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, God put that tree in the garden so that Adam and Eve would have a choice. He wanted to be in a relationship with them, but he wasn't going to force himself upon anyone. He's a perfect gentleman. He gave us a choice. You know, it could have hog-tied Tammy. Put her in a basement when I first met her. Tied her up, left her there and said, I'm not going to let you go until you say I love you. Now, if she said I love you, does, did she mean it? Of course not, but she didn't mean it. God doesn't hog tie us. He gives us a choice. So he placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden to give us a choice. And he was in effect saying to Adam, Adam, you and I are in this great relationship. But you can break off this relationship. You have a choice. All you have to do is eat of that tree. Eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, but you can eat of that tree. You can make that choice. But I warn you, if you eat of that tree, you'll be separated from me and you will die. Die in spirit and in body eventually, but die in spirit. You see, the spirit of life is connected to that relationship with God. And so when God gave Adam that choice and God, or Adam, Partook of that tree, he was in effect saying, God, I don't need you. I can determine for myself what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil. He made that choice. He was in a relationship with God. He was body, soul, and spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. He is spirit, soul, and body. And so when he made the choice, he became eternally separated from God. God put him outside of the tree, or outside of the garden. And he became separated from God. He died in the spirit. You see, we're created. Spirit, soul, and body. The body is the container of the soul. The body can only relate to physical, material things of this world. Things you eat, things you taste, things you can touch, whatever feels good. You know, the physical, material things of the world. Food, clothing, and shelter. Sex, drugs, and alcohol. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The physical, material things of the world. The body relates to those things. It can only relate to those things. The spirit can only relate to the things of God. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. It can only relate to God, the Spirit. It's the Spirit of life. The Spirit of life can only relate to God. When Adam left the garden, he died in spirit. So that left his soul and his body. The soul is craving life, the life that is given by God. But now there's no life. The soul is who you are. It's a part of you that's going into eternity. You will all go into eternity, either eternal life or eternal death. Soul craves life, though. When Adam was in the garden... His soul was subjected to the Spirit of God. His body was subjected to the soul. In other words, 
The Spirit of God was calling the shots. The soul was connected to the Spirit of God, and the soul controlled the body. When we're born, our souls don't control the body. Because we're wanting sex, we're wanting drugs, we're wanting satisfaction. But the only thing the soul can really, and that's the only thing the soul can relate to when we're born. We're all born separated from God. Because when Adam stepped out of the garden, we all stepped out with him. And we're all craving life. But the only thing I can relate to without God is my body. If it feels good, I've got to do it. If I want it, I've got to have it. That's the soul. And that's what we're all turning to. We're craving, so we turn to drugs. We're craving, so we turn to alcohol. We're craving, so we turn to sex. We're craving, so we turn to money. This is the only thing we can relate to. We have no life when we're born. But Jesus Christ came to give us life and life abundantly. To give us that river of life that flows eternally in abundance. That's what he came for. That's what he died for. He came so that we could be reborn. We died with the first Adam, but Jesus Christ came so that we could be reborn, regenerated, recreated. Because we are a new creation once we receive him. Nicodemus was a man of, of God. He was a man. He was the teacher of Israel. Turn with me to John chapter 3, verse 1. <laughs> I'm not even going to get a quarter of the way through this. <laughs> but we'll, we'll press it. There was a man of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were it. Everyone looked up to the Pharisees, right? Everyone that... that that wanted to be saved. All they, they looked to the Pharisee. These are, these are the guys they lifted up on a pedestal. He says, now there was a man of the Pharisees and named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the things that you do Unless God is with him. So Nicodemus, he's a ruler. He's, he's the example. He's the epitome of righteousness in the eyes of the people. If anyone could make it to heaven, it's going to be a Pharisee. But Jesus had pointed out that the Pharisees will lead you into hell. They're the blind leading the blind. And so Nicodemus, he knew there was something missing in his life. He knew that, that he, he, he had... Kept, you know, he was the epitome of righteousness, but yet he knew he was not righteous. And so he comes to Jesus by night because he didn't want to, the other Pharisees to see what he was doing, that he was talking to Jesus, so he came by, to him by night. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, be born again. That sounds a little nutty. How can a man be born when he is old? You know, I'm 65 years old here. <laughs> You're talking about being born again? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people say the water and the spirit speak of a physical birth. But then you have to destroy typology to come to that conclusion. The water always represents the word of God. You can't change Bible typology. Of course, we know the spirit is the ruach. It's the life of God, right? And in Genesis, we're told how God, in the midst of his creation, they we're told that the earth was formless and void. It was, it was, um, it was wrecked. It was a, a, a waste place. Is the Greek word or the Hebrew word that it would translate into? It was a waste place. But then we're told how the spirit of God began to move over the surface of the waters. Right, 
And what happened? God said, let there be light. That's what happened to us. Our lives were a waste place. But then we're hearing the Word of God. And then the Spirit of God begins to move over the surface of, of the waters. And what happens? We're reborn. A light enters into us. There's life. And that's what He does. His light enters into us. And it begins, just like in the Genesis account, God began to separate the light from the darkness. That's what happens in our hearts, in our lives. The Spirit of God moves in. It begins to separate the light from the darkness. What am I talking about here? There's a new birth, you see. I am a murderer. I am an adulterer. I am an immoral person. I am an idol worshiper. But that's this body. That's the old man in me, you see. But when the Spirit of God moved in, He began to separate those things from my life. He began to separate the light from the darkness. He brought life to my soul. And that I have life. So when I am separated from this current body, I'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the promises of God is that I'm not going to be a bodiless spirit. I'm going to be preserved complete. But it's going to be a sinless body, you see. He's separating the light from the darkness. That's what Paul says, you know, when in the book of Ephesians, he says, you are a new creation, the old man. Put that old man to death. That, that murderer, that adulterer, put that old man to death. He goes on to say, there was something else I was going to tell you guys that's really cool, but... My mind is not so cool anymore. <laughs> it's a, but anyway, their part will be in the lake of fire. The idolaters, the murderers. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I got it, got it, got it, got it. When we're born, we're born body and soul. We receive the spirit of life. We're going to heaven. But if you do not believe in this word, if you're one that's choosing to go with your feelings, trying to determine for yourself what is right, what is wrong, if there's no spirit of life in you, keep in mind what's happening. This world is going to burn with intense heat. And this body can only relate to the physical material things of the world, right? You haven't received Jesus. And so this body can only relate to the physical material things of the world. Which means your body is going to burn with the world. This physical material body is going to burn. Where does that leave your soul? Eternally separated from God. No life. Your soul, if it can only relate to the body, is going to burn eternally with this world. That's where your soul's at, right? If your soul's connected to this world, if that's all you know, that's all your hope, your body's going to burn. And your soul is going to burn. But your soul will burn eternally. Their parts will be in the lake that burns with, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's a second death. There's a physical death, Right? But then there's going to be this resurrection and this judgment. And then after the judgment, if you're, because all these books are going to be opened up. If your name's not found and written in the book of life, these other books are going to be opened up. And you will be found guilty. And you'll face that second death. That fiery death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come. <laughs> listen to this. I love this right here. Love it, love it, love it. Listen, listen. And I will show you 
the bride, the wife of the Lamb. We were the bride. We are the bride. But we're going to get married. And that's what's happened here. The bride of Christ is now the wife of Christ, of the Lamb. They're one. You know, Tammy and I got married at 18 years old. 18 years old. We've been married 37 years. And when we first got married, we fought, we squabbled. We, we just couldn't get along at times. But over the years, we got closer and closer and closer. And then we become one. We haven't had an argument. Now, we've snipped it at one another occasionally, but we have not had an argument in well over 20 years because we've become one. We're two different people, but then we got married and we've become one. We, became, we had different hopes, different dreams, different upbringings, different understandings, different likes, different dislikes, but over the years we've become one. You know, there's some days that I just know what she's, how she's going to respond to a given situation. She knows how I would respond. Because she knows my mind, and I know her mind. You see, this is the mind of God. And this is what we're learning. It's difficult times because it goes in opposition to this flesh. My flesh doesn't agree. <laughs> My flesh doesn't agree because that's the old man. But there's this new man, this new creation who's, who's called into the likeness of God. But see, what, where a lot of Christians are today, and I'm, I'm afraid many of them, maybe you, will go through the great tribulation because you're still living by the flesh. When, when, you're, when the word in your body, the old man, disagree. Some of you have a tendency to go with the old man. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want. That's in effect what a lot of people do. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I can do whatever I want. Well, you're in a marriage, man. And if you're, if you're in constant opposition with your spouse, it's going to be a miserable life. God is calling you into this marriage relationship so that we can become one with him. I'm going to press on here. And he carried me away in the Spirit, verse 10, and he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. I love that too. The city is the holy city. The New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, and it has the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. It says, And God spoke after long ago to the fathers and the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in the last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed as heir of all things, through whom He made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. It's the physical, it's the literal light of God. When you see Jesus, you're seeing the glory, the radiance. All that is good. But now it's found in this holy city. Why? Because we're also in this holy city. Coming down out of heaven. And I got to tell you, this is a big city. Again, this is the capital city of the new heaven and the new earth. It's a, well, let's just turn to that and let's go. All right. And <laughs> I like this next part too. Having the glory of God, her brilliance like a very costly stone of crystal clear jasper. What's a jasper? It's a diamond. It's a diamond. The jasper is a diamond. This is her radiance, the radiance of her glory. Where does the diamond come from? It's a big hunk of coal, worthless coal. 
That's all we were. You remember the old song, I'm just an old chunk of coal? That's us. But how does it become a diamond? Under immense pressure, heat, and pressure. It's transformed. That's why we're here. We're here for the transformation. You remember Paul's writing to these guys who's going through all kinds of hell? He says, just, just remember, you're a diamond. You see, that's why we suffer. That's why we go through hard times. We're taking on the mind of God. When I go through trials, when I go through difficulty, I get in check. What do I value? What do I want? What do I desire? It's that pressure that brings me into check. That's what the trials and tribulations, the sufferings, the deaths, the cancers and all that's about. It's to bring your heart, your soul into check. What do you truly value? Is it eternity? Is this new world, this new kingdom? You remember Adam and Eve? They were in a perfect garden paradise. Every need was met. Adam had all that he could think of. He had a woman to love. He had a hobby to keep him busy. He had all the wine that he could drink, all the food that he could drink. That's what God wants for us. A new heaven, the new creation. And, but meanwhile, we've got we've to let go. You know, see, we're white-knuckling this world. That's what the trials and tribulations, uh, James tells us, is about. To loosen our grip. To let go. It had a great and high wall and twelve gates. At the gates, twelve angels. And the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, or I'm sorry, the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the nor north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Jesus said, listen up. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I, if I, if I go to prepare a place for you, don't you know I'm going to come back and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be? This is the new kingdom. This is the, you remember, you know the bridegroom story that we had. Remember the, there was a wedding the bridegroom would go to create a, 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 to build an addition to his father's house. That's what Jesus is doing right now. And that time is coming soon. Sooner than you could possibly imagine. So he's going to prepare a place for us. And this is what he was telling his disciples about. This is the new kingdom, the new, the new holy city. And the wall of the city was 12... Or on, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. Let me finish. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So a lot of people want to divide this up. The Old Testament is the, uh, the, the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel. It's divided up 12. Uh, so you got the, the Jews, and then you've got the New Testament, which are, are the apostles, which represents the Gentiles. They're all Jews. The 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. They're all Jews. The way into the kingdom, God used the Jew. The 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Now we join in based on what they all did. <laughs> because we, jo we join in through the entire Bible where God used the Jew to give us his word. I'm thankful for the 12 apostles. I'm thankful for the 12 tribes. Verse 15. Then the one who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a, great, as a, as a square and its length is as great as its width. So it's a cube. He measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles square. You know what that comes out to be? 2,250,000 square miles. 
That's a lot of miles. So this, this ginormous city that's 1,500 miles high has 12 foundations. In other words, 12 levels. If there's 3 billion people who go to heaven, we all get a mile each. That's a huge city. We all get our own mile, square mile. It's, it's, it's enormous. And the measuring, and he measured its wall, 72 yards. 216 feet. That sounds like, that's a big wall. <laughs> no, no mistake about it. 216 foot wall. But compare that to the city itself. 1,500 miles. That wall is insignificant, you see. And all the walls between us, the barriers, the problems, the disagreements we have, will be completely insignificant. It'll be nothing. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like glass. Wow. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first stone, I mean, the first foundation stone was jasper, diamond. The second was sapphire. The third was caledony. The, th the fourth was emerald. The fifth was uh, sardic, sardinux. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoface. I, I didn't say that. Chrysoface. The eleventh, jasoph. The twelfth, amimus. Thank you. And the twelve gates were pearls. Twelve pearls. But listen, the, found, the stones, what he's describing, are the, the stones of the twelve tribes of Israel. They, the, the ephod, the high priest, had these 12 foundational stones upon the breastplate. They were actually over the heart. And they had two other stones, and they were called the Uman and the Thuman. And what basically, when the people of Israel had a question uh, 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 and they needed an answer, they go to the priest and they would consult, consult the Urman and the Thuman. Now, each one of these stones would uh, create a word. The lighted stones would create a word that could be spoken. And in this, so when someone would ask a question, these, these stones would light up in a, such a way that they could receive their answer. This is God's way of communicating with his people. When, there was, when the temple existed, when the tabernacle existed. So now they're coming to him and they're receiving the word of God. But what is this actually literally telling us? We're going to have the word of God with us. We're going to know his word. We're going to be in his light. So we no longer have to consult a priest because we're going to have the great high priest among us for all eternity. In verse 21, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. 12, the, all the 12 gates were 12 pearls. What's a pearl? A pearl is basically, it starts off as a grain of sand. It gets into the, the oyster. And it irritates the oyster. Well, the oyster will, as it's being irritated, will... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It basically covers the sand with chrysolite. And so as it begins to cover the sand with chrysolite, this chrysolite over time hardens and becomes a beautiful pearl. You see, these gates are speaking of us. We, we were the irritant <laughs> that, that Christ covered with his righteousness. We, we started off as a chunk of coal, then we become a dime. We were this grain of sand, this irritating grain of sand that Christ had to, over the years, continue to cover with his righteousness. I'm still an irritating grain of sand. 
Charlie probably more so than any of us, but or Glenn. <laughs> It just all speaks of us. We're all together, and we're all forming this, this kingdom. It's, Peter says, you are all living stones being fitted together to build the house of God. We're all living stones. And, you know, and God has brought us all together. Why? To irritate one another. There's a lot of friction within the body of Christ, right? That's how they used to build the temple, though. You know, all the work for the temple was done off-site. It was done in the quarry. Then they, after they finished the stones, they'd take them up to the temple mount. And you could not hear a hammer, a chisel, or any noise at all. It was totally quiet as they assembled the stones on the temple mount. So all the hammering and the chiseling was done in the quarry. All the work was done in the quarry. You guys heard the story before. You know, when they wanted to bring, they knew these two stones were going to fit together, they'd lay them on top of one another. And they'd rub the stone together. And it'd create all kinds of friction. But as they continued to rub these stones together, they'd fit so perfectly you couldn't slide a dollar bill between them. See, that's... We're in the quarry. We're on planet earth. The temple mount is heaven. All the work, all the hammering, all the chiseling, all the noise, all the rackets being done on planet earth. We're being prepared for that temple. We're all going to come together as one. All right, I'll... Uh, and... and We'll stop here because I really, yeah, I'm going to finish this one here. Uh, and, I, and I saw, no, where am I at now? Oh, right here. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent, transparent glass. What do you value? What do you hold to? There was once, as it was in John Corson's commentary, he says, uh, the golden rule is that the one with the gold rules. The golden rule is the one with the gold rules. See, that's what we're, that's what people want. They want the gold. They want the goods. They want the manna. They want money because money is what buys us happiness. But where's the gold in this city? How, much, how many of you really value asphalt? That's what we walk on. That's what we drive on. You know, the common person is not looking for asphalt. That's gold in the heavenly kingdom. We're going to walk in on it as if it's asphalt. Because there's no value in gold. You see, heaven, paradise, is going to be so great, so grand. But it's not where we're going. It's who we're going to be with. That's what we're longing for. That's what we're clinging for. Jesus said, keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on seeking. You know, I could go to a, an island paradise. But if I'm there by myself, it's not much of a paradise. You see, it's who's there with us. It's not the gold. It's not the money. It's not the silver. It's not what the flesh is craving. It's what the soul, the, the spirit, it's the, the satisfaction is found with him. Again, just keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on searching, Jesus said. And your heavenly Father will give you the Holy Spirit because what he's, lo he, he's what we're longing for. Amen? We got one final song. Uh, as the worship team comes forward, we'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this, this hope of heaven, this kingdom that is coming, this new heaven, this new earth. Uh, Lord, this is a fallen, wretched place. And I pray that each person here is longing, anticipating, 
uh, to, to come face to face with you. I pray that they all know you and they're all drawing nearer to you in a relationship and their lives are being transformed today. Um, as we let go of uh, the things this flesh cling to and grab hold of what you're offering to us, and that is you, Lord Jesus. It's in your son's name we pray, Heavenly Father. Amen.